Um, as he said, uh, my name is Madison. I uh, work, I'm a data engineer at Ookla, uh, the company behind speedtest.net. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and for a self-description, I am a white woman. I have my hair put back on one side and I'm standing here in my home office. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about data classes and pipeline definitions. A brief outline of what I'm going to go over today. First, I'll start with um, the problem space that we had at Ookla and what gave rise to the um, sort of space that this particular solution helped with. I'll give a bit of an introduction to data classes because I know they're not super familiar with everyone. Um, I'll also then talk about how we applied those data classes to our pipelines and all of the wonderful benefits that we got from that, including improvements to our validation, um, our testing, our alerts, and our documentation. Um, and lastly, I'm going to talk at the very end about our um, Airflow 2.0 performance improvements that we got from upgrading. So I'll just jump into it. Um, this is, uh, I'll give a little bit of an introduction to our ETL setup. We have a set of MySQL databases that we replicate to Redshift. Those MySQL databases receive the reports of speed tests that users take. And so that's very um, right optimized. And it's not a database that we want to use for larger analytics and bigger queries. So we replicate um, the tables and the data in MySQL to Redshift for those larger analytics. Um, in order to do that, we have three different pipeline types. Um, the first is a full pipeline where we replicate the entire table at every um, pipeline interval. Uh, these are things like fact tables or lookup tables, sort of the smaller tables that we just move over. We also have incremental tables where we only copy the newer records. So sort of as more tests are taken, we just copy the newer tests that don't exist in Redshift. And lastly, we have um, just a couple of rotating pipelines where we have an extremely large table that's updated frequently. And so we start um, by iterating over that table with chunks and replicating those chunks to Redshift. And then as soon as that pipeline gets to the end of the table, it starts back over from the beginning, starts replacing those records. We were previously doing this with AWS data pipelines, and that worked. The data was indeed moving from MySQL to Redshift, um, but there were a couple of pain points that we had with that. We primarily used the um, AWS UI for deploying those pipelines, and uh, that resulted in editing JSON in the AWS UI. Um, and that can be a little cumbersome too, because sometimes AWS data pipelines wouldn't accept the updates for a couple of iterations. So it became easier to just um, drop the pipeline and add a new pipeline with the new configurations. Um, additionally, an alerts for these pipelines were really unintuitive. We would get an alert in our Slack channel that just said, a pipeline has failed. And it was up to us to go into AWS data pipelines and figure out which pipeline failed. And sometimes pipelines had run several times. And so we had to go and hunt for the actual task that had failed. And then lastly, because we were doing JSON in the UI, um, it provided the opportunity for some configuration drift. So on you know, nights and weekends, if a pipeline failed, we would jump in and fix it. And we have all of those JSON definitions stored in a GitHub repository. Um, but it sort of, uh, you know, we didn't necessarily always update those in the repository with what was in the UI. And so with that sort of enabled some drift. And so this is sort of the perfect use case for Airflow. Um, Bit of a pivot, I'm gonna talk about data classes and give just a bit of an introduction to them. Um, I like to call data classes named tuples with batteries included. They are new in Python 3.7 and you can find the actual spec for the data classes definition in PEP 557. Data classes give us a ton of very cool features, things like auto-generated methods. Um, they're an easy way to provide defaults for uh, objects that describe some piece of data. We also get explicit typing with them, um, which is sort of a newer feature of Python in general. And then lastly, one thing that I personally prefer is data classes give us attribute access over key access. So we can have our IDEs help us out know which attributes are available rather than um, something like a dictionary where we have to know the specific keys that we want to access for those values.
a um, bit more of an introduction, I'll just give an example here. This is taken directly from PEP 557. So on the left here, we have a class that's an inventory item, and you can see that it's a data class because it's decorated with that data class. That inventory item um, describes an object that's in an inventory. Those objects have a name, which is a string, a unit price, which is a float, and a quantity on hand, which is an integer that defaults to zero. Additionally, there's a function there called total cost, which will, when called, compute the total cost of that object, that data class. Um, what we get out of this, so this is a sort of simple, straightforward definition, what we get out of this on the left is everything that you see here on the right. And I know that's a lot of text. The specifics of it aren't super important, but generally we get things like the init function, so we don't have to design self.name equals name. Um, we get a representation function of um, what this object would look like as a string with all of the attributes as part of that string. And then additionally, we get all of the equality operations between other data classes, things like equals, not equals, greater than, less than, equal to. Um, and so we get all of that for free just by using these data classes. So how can we apply these to pipelines? On the left, you'll see the uh, actual pipeline template data class that we use at Ookla. And so this has a bunch of attributes, things like schema and table. Um, it has space for source schema and source table if those differ from the target schema or the target table. We have Airflow attributes, things like DAG ID, connection ID, queue, and pool. Um, we can also define which clusters this go to because, or this particular pipeline goes to because we have several Redshift clusters. Um, and we can define a subset of columns uh, to pull over from MySQL. And if we don't use a subset, then it just defaults to the entire list of columns for that table. And so what's nice about this is if we define our pipelines in this manner, we're moving from JSON that exists in the AWS UI to pure Python that exists in Git. And the advantage there is that any changes that we make to those pipelines are tracked in our version control system. Um, additionally, we can subclass this base class um, for each of our pipeline types. So this class sort of defines common attributes that all of our pipelines are going to use, but we might have different things for full or incremental or rotating pipelines that we can then subclass. And I'll actually show an example of that in a little bit. And then lastly, and I'll show an example of this too, we have the opportunity to put a lot of logic directly into the class definition. Um, and so we can have a lot of things defined inherently just by way of instantiating this data class. In the lower right, here's a couple of examples. We're defining two different instances of a data class. That data class is the incremental pipeline template. Um, and so you can see things like schema, um, source schema, the table that's used in those pipelines, the schedule, schedule interval for those pipelines, these two differ. The, um, on the second uh, example, you can actually see the uh, sort of subset of columns that we're selecting from MySQL. And because we can put this as part of our configuration, we have some logic that's happening on the MySQL end as part of our select. Um, and so these, we get the advantage of having these sort of dictionary or YAML looking objects, but um, all of the advantages of having them be pure Python objects as well. So um, with data classes, you get a specific function called a post init, which you can modify after. This is just for containing all of the logic that you're going to run after the class is initialized. Um, and so I know there's a lot here. I'm going to point out a couple of different pieces. Um, in the upper left, we have a couple of default settings. So we have uh, uh, it set up so that if a source schema is defined, that is used. But if it's not, then the schema that's in the MySQL uh, database is assumed to be the same as, as where we're, we're sending it in Redshift. Additionally, we have things like a um, programmatically generated DAG ID. So all of our DAG IDs follow a very specific format. Um, additionally, we get things like DAG tags, um, just that we can base off of attributes that are on the data class. Um, on the right, you can see some more Airflow-centric attributes. Um, these are things like pool, priority weight, and queue. 
we have the opportunity when we set up our definitions to provide different pools, queues, that sort of thing. But we also have it set up um, at Ookla where we have a variable that this can also pull from. And so if we have a pipeline that's using more memory than expected, or we need it to be a higher priority for whatever reason, we can actually go into the Airflow UI and edit a variable, and the next run of that DAG will have that altered setting. Um, but ideally, for things that are going to be consistently like, oh, we know this one's going to be uh, a memory hog, then we would edit that in the actual pipeline definition. And then lastly, in the lower left, um, you can see there's a lot of logic that we have here for determining whether the pipeline should be in what we call debug mode. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about like the implications of that for us, but just the note here being, you know, there's you can throw all the logic that you want into um, that that applies to the breadth of your pipelines into this post init function. And so one example of this, this is actually the subclass of the full pipeline um, that we have. You'll notice that there's actually only one attribute that we're overriding, and that's the pipeline type. But then we have the opportunity to put in a function that will programmatically generate our doc string for us based off of attributes on the data class. Um, and so that just provides you know, some, some healthy or handy functions that we can use as we're, we're making our DAGs. And speaking of making DAGs, the real power that we found with data classes was taking those definitions and then applying them in dynamic DAGs. And so what we got out of that was we got um, shared queries and shared steps between all of the pipelines. Some of them had common steps, but even all of the incremental pipelines, they might have uh, you know, shared steps between them. And so we can now set that so that they all use the same steps. We also get shared alerting and all of the other Airflow goodies that we get, retries, that sort of thing, everything that comes bundled with Airflow. And so for us, what this meant is we moved from 180 pipeline definitions, where each JSON blob that we had that defined a pipeline had all of the logic for the machinery of that pipeline. And now we've moved from that to we just have the, the definitions of the core attributes of each pipeline. And then we have this big loop for each of our pipeline types. And I have it in pseudocode on the right, where we're just iterating over each pipeline in that list, and then creating a DAG for that pipeline. And so it shares all of that logic. On the left here, I have an example of one of the operators that we use in our, um, our DAGs. You can see that we're setting the, um, the attributes of the operator to just be the attributes of the pipeline, which in this case is that, that data class object. Um, and so for, for, for us, this is much easier for just access and development because we know, you know what attributes we have access to as we're building these things out. And then on the right, we have sort of a more general example. So data classes, um, the module data classes also provides this function called, called as dict, which will convert the data class object into a dictionary. And so that's super useful for us because for some pipelines, we might have more um, arbitrary fields or arbitrary queries that have to be run as part of the range selection for which values or which um, uh, data to move. And so here we can be totally agnostic about which attributes we care to use for the, the actual uh, templated SQL. We can just hand all of that into the, um, the operator uh, under the params attribute, and we get all of the attributes of the, the data class um, available within that template. Um, so now I get to talk about sort of how this really helped us. Um, the first was in validation. So as we're developing these pipelines, we actually get type validation through our IDE. So because we defined those types for each of those attributes, um, we get feedback when we use the wrong types as we're, as we're building these out. So in this case, clusters, we've set it to an integer, but it's supposed to be a sequence of strings, and our IDE gives us that information back. Additionally, because these are just Python objects, we can write up some logic to do extra validation. And so we have a utility that we run when we make modifications to a pipeline, 
to ensure that the table that the, that that pipeline references exists in both MySQL and Redshift, and that all of the columns that the pipeline references also exist. Um, and this we use as part of our PR process. So the tool spits out this this HTML, and it will let you know like if it failed or not. Um, and then we paste that into the PR to show that we have verified that the pipeline is ready for production. Um, additionally, I had talked a little bit about this with the debug mode, but we get some really helpful um, some helpful tools as as we're testing pipelines. So when a for us when a DAG is in debug mode, that the target for where that data goes actually goes to a debug table, and additionally. Um, we don't have to worry about creating the table because we have a couple of extra steps in the DAG that just make the table for us. And so this is super useful for local testing of pipelines because we can rest assured that um, we're not going to be pushing data to production as we're testing this locally. But then additionally, because of the logic that we had defined in the base class, we can set um, a particular DAG to debug mode in production if um, something's going wrong and we need to troubleshoot something sort of on the fly. And of course, we get like much richer alerts. Previously, it was just you have an error, and now it's, you know, we have all of the rich data that Airflow provides, but then on top of that, we have this Python object, which defines our pipeline, and so we have all of the attributes that are available there too, that we can just stuff into our, um, our alert. So here, this is an example of an Ops Genie alert, and um, we have some really specific information about which DAG, which task, and the exception that occurred. And then you can see below all of the pipeline details for which pipeline this referred to. And so in this case, um, it's saying something about extra columns, right? We can go and check in the definition, like, oh, hey, this column is missing from the list that was supposed to be um, supposed to be pulled, so something like that. And this has made, as you can imagine, this has made drilling down to the core issue much easier. And lastly, this has really helped with um, documentation too, because um, I know I keep saying this, but again, they're just pure Python objects, so we can um, sort of manipulate them like we would any other sort of list of entities. And so in this case, we've used it to um, generate uh, markdown documentation that's also included in our repo. And so people who may not have access to Airflow or just want a quick at a glance can go to the repo and see the documentation for um, some just quick information about some of the pipelines that we have. So now for the interesting part. <laughs> um, so this is a, uh, a graph of um, sort of a pivot here. This is a graph of our average execution duration since we started using pipelines back in October of 2019 um, th through with Airflow, I should say. Um, and so you can see if we've sort of, you know, hung around the average of 15 minutes um, per DAG. Um, I'm just going to point out some interesting features here. We have a non-trivial spike up to about 22, 23 minutes, and that occurred when we updated to uh, 110, 12. Um, and then we actually got back down to the previous levels by enabling DAG serialization, which was a feature that came shipped with 110, 12. Um, and then it's probably no surprise that the biggest drop that you see was when we upgraded to Airflow 2.0. Um, and we had a couple of spikes after that, which I'll just point out were sort of unrelated redshift issues. Um, but 2.0 has consistently been much faster for us, and we've actually seen overall a 50% reduction in DAG execution time, um, which is really easy, low-hanging fruit. All we had to do was sort of, you know, prep it for the upgrade and upgrade it, and we got um, reduced DAG execution time across the board, which was really cool. So some takeaways from today. Um, data classes can be used um, for pipeline definitions in lieu of something like YAML and JSON. We've seen a lot of examples of this or different companies throughout Airflow Summit have talked about this. So this is sort of a different spin on how to have those configurations set up um, while still getting all the benefits of sort of Python and Airflow. And additionally, using those native Python objects can make it easier to maintain these pipelines. For us, it was so much easier to um, sort of test and validate these uh, these definitions in Python than it was the 180 you know JSON definitions that we had. <laughs>
And lastly, if you haven't upgraded to Airflow 2.0, you totally should because there is a lot to get out of it. So that's all I have. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to move to questions now.